When you say it comes, those aspects come afterwards, for me, they are sort of inherent to the act of creation, that in drawing line after line, he is sort of, that is a, that's a sort of expression of this sort of, um, of his sort of contemplative, you know, process. In, in well, I think I, I, you're right. It is in there. But that is something I think that we, I mean, the drawing always, we always meet the drawing halfway. Mm. There's something, you know, there's the, in fact, you can say there are three stages. There's the world outside, either uh, in his case an imagination of Christ on the cross or a model in the studio or an object. And then it is put on the sheet of paper which becomes a kind of membrane between the real world and us looking at it. But then there comes this point of meeting that drawing. In other words, it's both what the drawing gives to us, but it's what we project onto it. In other words, the way in which we recognize the form as being a crucifixion. And so even though we can't see the top of the cross, we know that it's uh, a cross, the memory of all the other images of crucifixions or Christ on the cross, also memories of Michelangelo's slaves, all of those uh, association, memories of much later drawings that we bring when we look at it from Giacometti, as I've said, backwards, are all a part of what we see when we see the, see the drawing. So it's not to say, oh, it's wrong to say in those marks you see an awareness of vulnerability of approaching death. Um, but I do think it's, for me, it's not the process of the artist to be thinking of those while doing the drawing. And in that sense, the drawing will reveal who the artist is rather than the artist instructing the drawing to tell us something. Yeah. Does it matter how it was used? Um, I mean, if it was sort of produced for someone who was going to use it in a particular way in this case, or, or, or not? I really don't know enough about mm. Michelangelo's processes and the way these drawings would have been, whether it was done as an object of contemplation. Um, well, let's look at yeah. um, another, which I think sort of you just uh, spent a, lingered over sort of more instinctively. These are two uh, drawings by Rembrandt. Um, on the uh, on the right, uh, one uh, of only seven, I think, seven or eight signed drawings, which has been associated with a uh, with an etching of the same date. Uh, and on the left, uh, on the other side of the screen, uh, a small drawing um, which may have been made as a study for a larger grisaille oil painting now in uh, in Berlin. Um, and they are sort of, uh, they're, they're very different objects, but, um, but both quite, quite striking, I think, and technically very, uh, you know, very daring. Well, I mean, the, if you look at the man on the, on the right with his beard, that beard is clearly drawn with a very sharp quill, with a nib, and it's very carefully drawn. They're parallel, you can't see it so well in the slide, but they're very careful parallel lines of the hair of the beard which are drawn. And that's kind of what one expects. It's an artist knowing what he wants and what the form is. Uh, and then the bulk of the drawing, and particularly this drawing, which is astonishing, are drawn with a reed pen. And a reed pen is a blunt instrument. And so it's not as if you, you have to rely there on a kind of knowledge of your hand of where the blunt tip of this reed pen is actually going to hit the paper and draw it kind of on trust. And for me, the miracle of these Rembrandt paintings is kind of the intelligence of that trust. That allowing these very loose, they're very loose marks, they're not carefully directed completely, but they are completely eloquent of the actual gesture, of the way the, the figures are, of how, uh, how little you need to define a form of the cheek and the hair and the nose of the person sitting here. It's very different from the careful drawing with the... Uh, fine-tipped nib of tracing what you are seeing. It's a kind of impulsive gesture. I mean, he may have spent half an hour doing the beard, but you know that this is done in a few minutes. And for me, those are astonishing things to see. Artists who are finishing the work kind of as fast, if not faster, than they began it. Um, is there a sense for you also of, uh, can you sort of recall a moment in your own development where the the discovery of a new sort of medium has sort of triggered a particular sort of development or an advance as you would see it? 
Well, I, th I mean, they, oh, there's obviously a different setup. When a lot of these drawings were done, they were seen very much just as preliminary sketches and half-done things and notes to themselves. And it's a very much a modernist sensibility in which we love the half-finished, the alluded to, the uh, these more than some of the very detailed and finished paintings. And where this is a very much more of a contemporary sensibility than one of the of the time. But there's a sense in which what these pictures and these drawings show is the way in which the material and the medium, the physical ma matter in the studio is vital or becomes vital for me certainly in finding not just a particular image but also the thematics of it. So in my case, um, discovering the imperfections of erasure when I was trying to erase charcoal drawings set in a whole series of th themes of memory and memory loss and historical mm -hmm. Um, memory or working with a bad paintbrush that couldn't give you a sharp line set in place a whole idea about the randomness of foliage and a whole series of tree drawings. So it's not that suddenly Rembrandt having done these drawings would have found a whole new series of uh, themes to work on but as someone looking at them now um, there's a, a kind of an affirmation of what it is to work with confidence and certainty in a blunt way in the hope that an image will come back to you from that. I mean, the, to, to look at all of these drawings, they're both object lessons in what one's never going to be able to achieve, um, which is fine. Not many people have ever achieved anything <laughs> like this. I mean, maybe three. And um, so that's fine. But they, they certainly give a sense of, oh, boy, to be back in the studio drawing again and keep these, these Rembrandts in one's head. Mm. Well, we, we uh, bid farewell to the prints and drawing study room and set off for the gallery itself and started in the earliest part of the collection looking at this wonderful early Netherlandish triptych by Robert Campin, who was an artist working in Tournai at the same time as uh, Jan van Eyck, so the painter of the Ghent altarpiece and the Arnolfini marriage in the National Gallery. And you're looking here at a triptych um, with uh, three panels, uh, the donor in the right wing seated at the end of a path through a landscape and above him the three crosses on Golgotha. In the centre, obviously, the entombment um, with Mary embracing her, her dead son and the resurrection uh, in the left-hand panel. And we've pulled out a couple of details that we focused on, uh, including the, uh, the detail of the, of the crosses and the ladder uh, and the extraordinary sort of uh, intensity of uh, emotion that is uh, expressed in these mourning figures uh, around Christ. I mean, from, I suppose when looking at pictures like these and ones in the, a lot of the earlier pieces, when, and I'm sure it's not just me as an artist, I'm sure a large number of artists do, one does it as a kind of hyena. Um, biting different sections of it that feed one in different ways. So in a strange way, I mean, I know it's the donor and it's a beautiful sort of five o'clock shadow that the Flemish artists uh, or Northern European artists knew how to paint better than everyone else. And you can look at all of Holbein as different ways of thinking about five o'clock shadow, the old stubble, which is kind of I'm, fantastic. I'm making but, a note on that as if but the, it's a fut the, future exhibition at the Warthog Gallery. Yeah, right. Yes. The five o'clock shadow. <laughs> there was a fantastic exhibition at the Royal Academy here of paintings of kings over the time. Mm. And I thought that was, it was a remarkable painting lesson in 16 different ways of painting sable and ermine and velvet. And they really were. It was a, but in my, you know, for me going through it, one of the thoughts is, okay, that ladder against a pole is a beautiful vertical, simple, element in some shadow figures that I'm cutting out and making. So that was filed away as a notice. For some processional object which are being carried, which have to have include kind of heads of dead figures, I was going through the ground floor of the courtyard, looking at the different ways in which dead heads are drawn. So in this case, the particular shape where the shadow comes under the cheek in the Christ figure over here, um, the different ways in which eyes in anguish, what, what the artists have done with the shape of the muscles around the eyebrow. So it's kind of 
making notes in, in that sense. Not that I was anticipating remaking a triptych of the deposition or the burial of Christ, um, but one understands the things that artists were working with, even though there's this whole other elaboration and a whole other set of meanings that's definitely there. It's not to deny those. But the things that continue, if you think of the painting of the women weeping and that continuity to the remarkable images that Picasso made of weeping women um, as, a, as a kind of continuity. And so it was kind of a study of the, of the woman in white, the study of the woman in the blue, the blue uh, dress just above. It was, those were the kind of the notes that I had in my head while looking. You may have lost your mind. Oh, sorry. Uh, for me, I love this detail at the top left of the, uh, the scroll coming out of the donor's mouth, just brushing the bottom of that ladder of Christ's cross, which is really a clue to the way that this picture can also be read as, um, as in a sense, this central panel being a, a sort of uh, an emanation of the donor's sort of spiritual exercises, an expression of his sort of creative imagination in a, uh, in a spiritual way. Um, it really is the most extraordinary and vivid thing, and one imagines it seen by candlelight uh, on an altar, and it must have just been um, sort of miraculous in a sense. Can I show one yeah. thing with that? Uh, it's the, uh, is the mic, yes, the mic is working. Um, there's also, if you notice, there's a sort of basket work fence over here. And what you can't quite see is how it continues just over there at the edge of the second picture. And so what a lot of these early paintings do, which were built and in, painted into the form of altarpieces and triptiches and doors that would close, together with the Tiepolo sketches you have on the first floor, again, which have shaped images within the canvas. There are, for me, an important uh, memory that our idea of a painting as being something in a rectangular frame is of very relatively recent origin. And the possibilities that this offers of thinking about projections that aren't held within an exact frame or drawings that shift out and, uh, and move, there is a, an exploration of the mixture of architecture and image making that was sort of lost for centuries, or it wasn't a question when you were painting within the, the question of a rectangular canvas. Um, and so these early paintings in which the shape of the canvas is, um, is almost a byproduct, not something the artist is thinking about, it's a given, are very productive for me. And going to the, at the Tate um, Gallery yesterday, looking at the Malevich exhibition, what I hadn't realized, which the exhibition in a wonderful way makes very clear, is how what one thinks of the great imaginary leaps into suprematism with the black square and the black cross, in fact come directly out of the work he was doing for The Victory Over the Sun, a theatrical production in which he was thinking about painted backdrops. And because he wasn't thinking of it as a painting, he was thinking of this in the use, in the service of the piece of theater, the painted backdrops. There were geometric things he let himself do in the costumes and in the backdrops that he would never have done in a painting up to that point, but which, when once done, opened the floodgates to a whole new way of thinking about what painting could be. So I'm interested in the inauthentic origin of new images. And so this for me was a, I mean, it's a very, oh, sorry, no, no, we've gone to the next one, a very small detail, but a way of thinking how one can actually push an image across into the next section of a wall, bring different parts of what a gallery or an exhibition or a studio is to the picture. So this must have been on your family trail of dead heads in the Courtauld <laughs> Gallery, I think. But um, this is a, uh, a, a work by the workshop of Giovanni Bellini, of which there is a, another version, the prime version, in the National Gallery. Painted around uh, 1509, the National Gallery's version 1507, we think. It tells the um, story of the sort of gruesome assassination of a Dominican uh, inquisitor called uh, Peter Martyr, uh, who was set upon by Cathar heretic assassins when traveling uh, on the road from Como to Milan, apparently.